Good morning. So it's my pleasure to introduce our seminar speaker for today, who is Ari Daniel. Ari is an award-winning freelance science journalist based in Boston, Massachusetts. Um, Ari received his undergraduate degree from Boston College in biology. He has a master's that he earned while doing a Fulbright fellowship at the University of St. Andrews, where he worked on gray seal vocalization. Later, he earned a PhD um, at Woods Hole and MIT. His dissertation research was on Norwegian killer whales. Um, as a journalist, his, his work has appeared in a variety of media, including National Public Radio, Public Radio International, The New York Times, and NOVA. Uh, recently, he and his colleagues have been producing podcasts in our region relative to oil spill research. Um, and today, Ari's going to talk to us about carving story from science. Thank you, Will. Hi, everybody. <laughs> Uh, okay, I am not allowed to go past the podium this way. I am in a bounding box. If I move out of that box, tell me. Uh, and hello, everybody who's, I'm on, it's like YouTube. Hello. Okay, <laughs> so uh, I, I'm going to talk a bit about um, how to tell stories about science and how you might think about communicating science. Uh, we've got about an hour, right? So I'm going to do some talking, and then I, I really want you to do a little bit of uh, your own thinking about it for your science as well. So there's going to be time for that too. So um, let's see. Is this guy? Oh, on. Is that the on at the top here? On the side? Oh, where it says on. Okay, all right. Um, okay, so maybe this is, uh, I'm going to put this out there as maybe a, a possible way that you might feel, that you've got uh, some kind of interest in science. It's like a slow burning flame of passion and of commitment and of uh, dedication to science. There's something about it that excites you. Um, and perhaps it's the sort of thing that keeps you up at night because you're so excited, or maybe it's just some looming grant deadline or a thesis committee that's keeping you up. But for some reason, you're staying up. And, uh, and, and sometimes people will ask you what it is you do and why you spend so much time here and, um, and, and, and what is it that you're doing. And so, and so you, you, you feel like you know, you've got all this stuff inside that you want to share. And so you just want to open up the door and let it out. But when you do, it comes out like this. You know, it's this like maze of an impenetrable wall that you can't, you can't see the person anymore. And this comes out and then they're like this. And, and so the question is, how do you get people to feel the same kind of uh, flame and fire that you feel for your science uh, by talking to them about it? And so that's what I want uh, to speak about. Um, and the way that I think you can do that is through telling stories. Or at least, I mean, that's what I do, uh, and I'm biased. But um, that's, I think, a really good way to think about how you can take what it is you care about and convey it to, to other people. Um, and why stories? Well, stories are who we are. Uh, we are the unique sum of our stories. Uh, very literally, we are, uh, stories are woven into our heritage about where we come from. And our stories are lodged inside our brains. And we, uh, we think about, I mean, we all have, uh, we're, we have science stories. We also have personal stories about where we grew up and uh, the first time we tried riding a bike and the first time we fell in love the first time we fell out of love, all of those things. We're all uh, this collection of stories. And stories connect us through space and time. They're a way of connecting way back to where we've come from, to our ancestors who told stories, um, and, and they're ways of, of connecting across space as well. Now, I want to um, play a clip. Uh, uh, how many of you were at uh, Bays and Bayous when I talked a couple nights ago? Okay. This is the only duplicate clip. Uh, everything else uh, you won't have heard. But um, this is one of my favorite uh, 
radio pieces. And it comes out of uh, the Cape, where they had a project called the Sonic ID Project. They're still doing it, where they interview people all over the Cape and then boil out these 30 or 60 second nuggets that they put into the broadcast during the day. So in between the news that's coming out of, um, uh, you know, from across the country and around the world, you hear from your neighbor. And so this is one of those stories. Um, and it was produced by Atlantic Public Media and Jay Allison. My husband is a retired dairy farmer. A dairy farmer. No one can hear that. So let me turn the volume up here. Great. Give that a try. Okay. Yep. My husband is a retired dairy farmer. A dairy farmer works seven days a week. He had never seen the ocean. So when we were married, we came to the Cape so he could see the ocean. Barbara Yamamoto of Harwichport. His eyes filled with tears and he said, I have to live here. And here we are, and here we intend to stay. You're listening to the Cape and Islands NPR stations. Was that loud enough? Yeah, okay. So. Um, I, I love this story. It's 20 seconds of a woman talking about her life story where you hear her relationship to her husband and their relationship to the ocean. And I think that um, th my I think that with stories you can get people to care about the things you care about by hearing why it matters to you. So um, and so this has a lot to do with science. And as I go, I want you to think about how what I'm saying might apply to what it is that you study and what you're working on, because um, I want, we're going to talk about that um, uh, in a little bit uh, more specifically. So first off, I just want to get from you, what are in the ingredients that go into any story, stories that you read or watch in the movies or watch online? Place, a setting, yeah, what's your name? Jennifer. Okay, so a place, a uh, location often helps, yes. What else? E emotion? Great. What's your name again? Mike. Okay, an emotion. What do you mean by emotion, Mike? That's great. Good. So emotion is an important ingredient for story. That's great. So emotion, place, what else? Yeah, Allison? Okay, great. Yeah, so some sort of like, uh, yeah, context or scene setting, like a platform that you're going to base the story on. That's great. Thanks. Yeah, Kristen? Characters? Terrific. Almost went beyond the, the line. <laughs> I didn't, though. Uh, characters. That's great. Good. Characters? Yeah. Message? What do you mean? What's your name? Edwin? A pl mm hmm Great. So a message, a plot. I almost think of those as a little bit different. Like a plot is kind of the arc, maybe, the path that you'll travel uh, from beginning to end. And the message might be like if you want some sort of takeaway or moral or something. Great. Thanks. Other things? Look, that's that's good. That's that's a good set of things. So when you're thinking about what your science story might be, those are things you should include. You should include characters. You should include a setting. You should have a sense of the arc that it's going to follow. It should have emotion. It should have a, a sense of context as well. So I want to talk for a second about complexity because I think that Often what can happen is, you know, you spend so much time working on a particular thing in the lab and you know it really intensely and, and in a detailed way. And how do you then communicate that to other people? So, you know, this, this sort of thing may be completely comprehensible to someone who's in the field, but outside of the field, this really means nothing. I mean, there's like so much going on here. Again, this is often maybe how we might talk of what's happening at a spreading center at the bottom of the ocean, but 
you know, what, what are people going to care about? Well, I mean, I'd certainly want to know, like, what the thing actually looks like. If you've gone down there, what's it like to be there? Um, but how do you take something like this and turn it into something that's more accessible? Now, one thought on that is it's like if you have an image like this and I said to you, okay, call somebody up and I want you to tell them, describe this image to them so that they can draw a picture of it on the other end of the phone, that would be a very challenging task. However, if you focus in on one element of it and you talk about George who got stuck between two cattle inside a box for some reason, you know, that, that is a way into talking about this complex scene. You find a starting place that allows you then to give people a kind of sense of part of it and then you can begin building out around it. And it helps reduce all the noise. Like we know, you know, when we study something, this is where we are. Like this is the stuff of a dissertation, you know? There's like so much going on here. But for someone who's just like, oh, so what do you do? They can't handle this, okay? You gotta, you gotta move in here. So um, I am not saying that you take something that is as nuanced as this and turn it into something that's overly simplistic. Um, instead, I'm suggesting that you find a way uh, to communicate that complexity. So I want to show you an example from, um, uh, from a guy uh, whose name is Tim Chartier. He's a mathematician at Davidson College in North Carolina. And uh, he is also a professional mime artist. I think he, the intersection of mathematicians and mime artists is one, and it's that guy. And uh, he's terrific. So, he, um, so let me play you this, uh, this uh, clip. It's from a sketch of his, I'm just going to play a portion of it, uh, from a sketch of his called Infinite Rope. Uh, there's no sound. <laughs> oh, wait a minute, sorry, let me back it up. It took a little bit to queue up here. Tim does this sketch for lots of different audiences, including for kids. And, uh, and kids love mime. <laughs> I've seen him perform, and they just, he, they go crazy. So what he talks about, you know, so he's got this rope that's infinitely long, and he's interacting with it. And he'll ask the kids afterwards, he said, so I had a rope that went on forever in both directions, and then I cut it in half, and half of it goes away. How much is left? And the kids will say, uh, what's left is, uh, it, 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 st it still goes on forever. Or they say it's as long as a thousand, which is the biggest number they can come up with. So, but the point is that they understand that when you take, when you divide infinity in half, you still have infinity, which is not an easy concept to get. And yet Tim has figured out a way through mime to teach people that concept. Here's another example. 
this is uh, a piece that uh, I worked on. It's a similar model for the, to the sonic IDs, except we call them science minutes, and they're short um, 60 or 90 second science-based stories. So I study how an embryo develops. Development has its music, definitely. I think early development has Pink Floyd as its music. Really great anthem for the very early divisions of frog and fish embryos. Two cell stage, four cell stage, eight cell stage, and it goes really well with that particular beat. And then later on it gets to be more melodious because there are so many cells all working together and doing their own thing that the music becomes much more complex. But they're discrete notes in the music. You can make the analogy to the discrete cells. And then I move to the who for, <laughs> for when the nerves actually start working, kind of has the rhythm of the impulses that the nerve cells are putting out. Tommy, can you hear me? Can you feel me near you? And it's discreet, but it jumps. Tommy, it's not smooth. Can I help to cheer you? Tommy, can you hear me? You're listening to the Cape and Islands NPR stations. That's Hazel Siv. She's a developmental biologist at MIT. Uh, I interviewed her for about an hour and a half about her research, and it was at the end that she told me that she often thinks about her science in terms of music, and she figures out how to score different developmental processes to different songs. Um, and, you know, that was, that was just divine. So, you know, here she's talking about, again, a, a rather complex thing, which is how an embryo is developing. And it's not always developing in the same way, but it's like changing as it's developing. And she scores it to music and in her head, and then we did it in the radio piece. And I don't think of development in the same way. So Hazel uses music to translate complex ideas. So. I, so I don't think it's, I, 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 I do not like the term dumbing down. I don't think you have to dumb anything down. I think people are capable of dealing with complexity, but it just ha but you can't talk to them in a complex way. You know what I mean? You have to come up with a s simple ways of, of, of delivering your content, but that content can be complex. Third point, it is okay to have feelings. Uh, this goes to your point. Is as scientists, we often are like, no, feelings. I don't. I'm not. I don't feel stuff. Of course, you feel things. You know, it's like that's like every day you're feeling things. Like, you know, I'm excited to be here. I hate being here. Whatever it is, you know, it's like you have an emotional response, and it's important when telling stories that you include that emotional uh, element in your storytelling. Um, so, and of course, we're not. Uh, just like totally left-brained people uh, that deal, that talk only about science facts, we also have uh, this other part of ourselves that um, is colorful, and, and not to say that science is not colorful, but I mean, uh, you know, you know what I mean. Like, you know, we've got these other parts of ourselves that we should address. Um, let me. Uh, Hazel Siv uh, said something about this that I want to play for you. The way we write science, and maybe the way we design experiments, is kind of dry and directed. But behind all that, there is tremendous struggle and anxiety and striving and triumph. And so the emotion of doing science, I think, is enormous. So here's an example from uh, a piece I did. I, I, I interviewed my former master's uh, advisor, Peter Slater and he studies uh, birdsong. Listen to that, just as we walk in the Botanic Garden, a wren. That's the same as your wren, it's a winter wren. They're small and brown and speckledy, and they have a tiny little upturned tail. Wren song has about the highest rate of production of, of notes of any bird song. I can't remember how it is. It's 30 or 40 different notes in one second. I mean, they really come very, very thick and fast. The most extraordinary little bird, you know, an incredibly varied song it produces at a fantastic rate and produces a huge volume of sound out of this tiny, tiny little body. There it is. I, I mean, it is so difficult to describe sounds verbally. 
I think it's, I mean, it's right, like describing wine or something like that. You know, you get these people who are extraordinarily expert at using particular phrases to describe the taste of a white wine or something. And it's like these sort of sounds. How do you describe that? You have to hear it, really. So Peter does not, ch- I mean, he's not even, well, of course, you can hear him and his love of this little bird with a tiny little upturned tail in, as he's talking. You know, it's just, it's him. And he's, he's not backing away from his love of the subject or his admiration for the phenomenal capacity of something that we might otherwise just blow right past. So I think honoring your, uh, your connection, your, non, uh, your subjective connection to the thing that you're talking about and that you're studying is okay. Uh, and it can invite people in. When you talk about something in an excited way and you show your passion or whatever your feelings are, you know, your hatred towards an invasive species, whatever it is, you know, y- by bringing that in, it makes it much more real. Okay, so I want to talk a bit about uh, some story types you might think about for how to cast your science. Um, the first is that, you know, because you are operating in a place, as Jennifer said, like the the place of Jennifer, right? Okay, a, a place is uh, it, it gives you scenery and gives you a location to talk about your story in, and that place may be pretty, uh, it may be not as pretty, but it gives you a kind of uh, space. So um, think about the location and the scene where stuff is taking place, and convey what that place looks like and feels like and sounds like and is like when you first when you have to wake up in the morning before the sun rises in order to get the data sampler you know that's like a general you know what I mean like a, whatever you're using to sample your data uh, you know you got to get up before the crack of dawn in order to put that in the boat to go out you know give us a sense of place and of course you know this scale is is hugely important because you know some of you may study things that are really tiny that we can't see um, or that are really vast in, in terms of space or time that are harder to visualize but bring us either inflate us up or or take us down shrink us down to that level so that we can appreciate the characters and the stage that the story is taking place on so uh, here's an example of a a, a clip from a piece that I did for Radiolab about uh, coccolithophores. In that test tube that Willie's holding are millions of tiny single-celled plants called coccolithophores. Cocco, coccolithophores? Yeah, and there are lots of them in the sea. There's probably about 100,000 of these coccolithophores in a teaspoon of seawater. Tell me about the coccolith. Like, what do they look like? They're basically like, uh, they're like tiny little translucent balls with you know there's a slight tinge of green but the key thing is that the outside of that ball it has these white plates tiny circular shields of chalk because the coccolithophores are fighting for their lives fighting with whom each other viruses these viruses that are shaped like like diamonds so here's what happens. Imagine you're a coccolithophore okay. floating in the ocean, and along comes this diamond shaped virus, and it jams its diamond tip into you. In between these plates, and, and actually get inside the cell. The that chinks way. in the armor. That's right, it's like the chinks in the armor. And the coccolithophore just engulfs it. Okay, people have different. And the virus thinks, yes, I'm in here. And then it sort of makes straight to the nucleus. And it's at that moment that the viral takeover begins. People have different uh, views on that particular aesthetic. And uh, however, uh, the point is that you, you know, I, with radio, I mean, that's one of the things I love about radio is you can be the size of a virus easily without huge production value. Uh, and um, I, I mean, like costs, production costs. Um, So, you know, we shrink ourselves down to the size of something that's happening. And when you're at that size, 
a battle is taking place, and it is okay to talk about it like that. And there are characters, and there's something at stake, and there's tension, and there's an arc, and it's happening in a place. It, it's like it's fully charged with all the narrative elements that we talked about earlier. When you're back out at this high level looking at the test tube, you don't see any of that. So if you shrink your, your listener or the person you're talking to down to that space, it can come alive in the way that maybe you actually understand it. You know, but to help someone else understand it like that, it often helps to change perspective. So another a story type are the, the rare, though uh, lovely, moments of discovery or of epiphany. I had two during my five years in graduate school, one of which was wrong. So uh, I really, I think that means I only had one. Uh, and, you know, so that moment, I mean, I feel like this moment is like, it's, it's, it's such a high, you know, when you get it and you understand something or you see something for the first time that no one else in the history of humanity has seen or touched and you're there first, like that is amazing. So, um, but, you know, but stories don't always have to end with like great fireworks. You can reach something and then it you know, it's not what you thought it might be, but, you know, finding these, like, spectacular moments of success or failure, you know, are interesting stories. Um, also, uh, thinking about portraits of people or things, you know, maybe it's a story about your um, uh, advisor uh, or someone else in the lab or a teacher of yours that, you know, that got you to the place where you're at today, or somebody you met in the field who had a way of putting things into perspective. Um, but 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 finding, a, developing a portrait of someone whose, whose viewpoint or whose story is relevant to what you're doing, um, you know, that the work you're doing might be impacting a community and you uh, hear what that, what that means to the individual who's located in that community can be really powerful. The other thing is because you're, some of you, how many of you do field work? Okay, because many of you are doing field work, it takes you out onto the ocean, right, to the sea, the gulf, you know, I mean, it's not maybe like this, uh, but it can get rough out there. There are stories that happen at sea, and like that, honestly, you know, like I've talked to chemists before who don't go to sea, who do chemistry in beakers and stuff. And the fact that you can actually locate some of your stories out at sea, that is tremendous. I mean, that's great. And you should take advantage of that. Stories from the high seas or from the bay. <laughs> uh, also, you, you have, you are a story. And you know, the stuff that you are, um, the, the stuff you're feeling and you're doing and what brought you here to this moment um, is, is important to, to think about. And, um, and the more specific you can get about that, the better. You know, a statement like, I've always been interested in science is vague, okay? If you can hone in on, on, a, th on a moment, a memory, that can be helpful. And I, so I'll play you a couple of examples of what I mean. Oh, first... Uh, oh, yes. <laughs> this is a photo uh, that's going to say, You're, I'm going to have you do this soon. Don't be scared. It'll be okay. Um, so, a couple of examples. Uh, I, Krolwich is one of my favorites. Uh, you know, I think he's just a terrific uh, science writer. And so, here's uh, something that he, is from a blog post he did a couple years ago. The title's great, Dirty Dancing, A Gallant Spider Goes All the Way. But the opening line of this thing, before I break your heart with a magnificent demonstration of naked, forlorn, magnificent passion, I should tell you a thing or two about the male jumping spider. The, the, um, these sentences, they take a long time to write or to figure out how to write them, to get someone to want to read beyond the first sentence. Uh, and then to the second sentence, and then on and on to get to the end of the article, especially on the web when you have so much stuff that's like competing for your attention. So, you know, one trick is that you, you give someone a teaser that's like, before I break your heart with this, you know, because then you're like, oh my God, how's he going to break my heart? You, 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 you buy a little bit of time, and you can say, okay, I'll tell you about the spider, 
And then you know you're going to get to the point where, you're gonna, where your heart's going to be broken. Um, there's a program, uh, 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 there's a program organization that's based out of uh, New York uh, called Story Collider. I run the Boston arm of it in Boston. It's like the moth where people get up to tell live stories, personal stories, but they all connect to science. Uh, it's, it's a lot of fun. We get five tellers up. They talk, they tell eight to ten minute stories around a particular theme um, and, uh, and uh, before, before a crowd of people. Uh, and I want to play you a few clips from that, those, uh, from stories that, that uh, we've had. Um, the first clip is from, uh, oh, and I should have mentioned, the guy in the Coccolithophore piece is Willie Wilson, who um, up until recently was at Bigelow Marine Laboratory. Um, the, the first person in the Story Collider example is from the same part of the world at the Darling Marine Center, Skylar Bear. She's a PhD student there. Um, and so, so this is from the, an early part of her story. And again, I want you to listen to how specific she is. One of the things that I was obsessed with as a kid was uh, the sinking of the Titanic. And I would spend hours poring over this book called Exploring the Titanic. And I'd look at pictures of China and dolls' heads and shoes of dead people. And I thought about the dead people. <laughs> and then I thought about the animals down there that ate their bones. And I was like, oh, I really want to see it. And I really don't want to see it either. And actually, when I was 11, I made this board game called Fraction Titanic. And you had to solve math problems to get to the lifeboat. I thought it was hilarious because the Titanic broke in half when it sank. So, so hence the name Fraction Titanic. So she's talking about her lifelong love of the bottom of the ocean with incredible detail. She takes you back to specific moments in time that she strings together into a narrative. So it, it, there's obviously we're like enjoying it as we're listening to it. That's so much more effective than ever since I was five, I've had some of a thing about the sea, you know? It's really specific. Um, later in the story, after she tells us that she eventually gets on the Alvin to go to the bottom of the ocean and fulfills this lifelong dream of hers, she goes to the bottom of the ocean, and apparently, it's, it's, it sounds like a bit like a game show, you're allowed to make one call from the bottom of the sea. And she doesn't think twice. She's calling her dad, who has been like a, a guiding light for her her whole life. So that's where this part of the story picks up. We set up the call to my dad. And one of the first things he says, he goes, so you see any giant squid down there? And I'm like, no, dad, it's hydrothermal vent. There aren't any giant squid down here. <laughs> it's like really embarrassed. <laughs> But I do start telling him about what is down there, and you know, never in a million years would you guess what is at a hydrothermal vent. You're sitting in this canyon, and there's all this shimmering water um, coming out of the cracks, and there are all these tube worms at all these strange angles, and they're white as bone with these bright red gills, and it almost looks like a, a rose garden, but a very strange one. And there are all these white ghost crabs scuttling around, and purple fish, and just the most amazing things and then you're just like I am sitting on top of a volcano basically I was just so impressed with nature <laughs> in that moment and then the pilot asks me later on he's like so did the uh the, the dive deliver we're still down there and I'm like well I really wish that I had seen a Dumbo octopus and then like 10 minutes later a Dumbo octopus appeared so it was just like the whole day was for me so I love the juxtaposition between uh, how ordinary the, her reaction is to her dad, like just like how she'd be embarrassed by him. She's all the way on the sea bottom, and he's asking her embarrassing questions like only a dad could do. It's so it's so something that everyone can relate to, even if we will never, and most of us will never, go down to the bottom of the ocean. We've had those moments with family embarrassing us in public, uh, and then she juxtaposes that really kind of relatable thing with this environment that she paints a beautiful picture of and tells us about a place that means something to her. And then, and then she ends it with that gorgeous line, you know, that it's like the day was made for me. And that is, I mean, that's how exquisite. You know, it's like a poem or something. And again, so specific with her recollection of that event. 
Um, I'm going to play you the first 10 seconds of another story, uh, this one by Nicholas Hudd, who's um, a chemist at Georgia Tech. Tonight I'd like to talk to you about something that's even more important than science, which is my mother. Nick proceeds to talk about his relationship with his mom, who is a very uh, strong um, believer in Catholicism, and his negotiating that uh, distance as he became more and more interested in science and how he fought to get her to understand and care about what he was most interested in um, until he is eventually invited by like the archdiocese in LA to give a talk and his mom like is lives in LA and he gets to invite one person and he invites his mom and she is so proud of her son who has finally made it and is sitting next to the Monsignor in front as he's talking about chemical evolution and about um, his science. So, But his setup for that story I think is great because he's going to tell us about something more important than science, but he's a scientist. What could possibly be more important to him than that? Oh yeah, he's a kid, you know? He's a boy who's got a mom and we've all got family that we can maybe connect to. So. So I think that being specific and thinking about relationships in the world that we have with our science and with other people that can, that can relate to others, that the people that we're talking to can be a really powerful way of bridging a gap. Okay, so right before um, we, we take a, a break where you guys are gonna talk in pairs about how you might cast your science in story form, I want to address one more thing and that is, well, what if I study something that isn't cool, like Dumbo octopus, you know? Or is, you know, I studied whales for my thesis. That was often an easier sell than something that might be more technical or that ha that's harder to relate to. And I submit to you that you can still do it. Um, here's an example from a story that I pitched uh, a couple of years ago. This is a story of obsession. In the early 1990s, Tom Hales, a mathematician now at the University of Pittsburgh, became interested in solving one of the biggest problems in math. Called the Kepler conjecture, it predicts how best to pack cannonballs in a space. The proof eluded mathematicians for over four centuries. Hales had a key insight in 1994 and realized that to have any hope of solving the problem, he had to devote himself entirely to the cause. He and a student did just that. In 1998, they had a proof requiring 300 pages and 50,000 lines of computer code. Hales, ecstatic, submitted their proof for publication. The editor soon wrote him, the 12 reviewers were 99% certain that Hales was right, but they couldn't be sure. They needed more time. Five years passed, and Hales received a similar letter each year. Finally, the reviewers said they couldn't verify the proof. They rejected it from publication. Hales was furious. He says in math, there are rules. A proof is right or wrong. And so he rebelled. He's now using special software to validate every step of his proof. Very soon, the computer will tell him if he's right. And at that point, Hales says, the human reviewers will be irrelevant. So this is not... You know, it's it's a it's a math story, and on it, I love doing math stories. They're hard to find. You know, I mean, in order to like do a story about math on the radio. So when I heard about this one, you know, the story for me was about this guy who was like so de like devoted, like you know, to this to this conjecture about cannonballs. You know, he had to solve it, um, and and that sense of uh, of how I started, like obsession, that is a, a feeling that many people can relate to. Maybe not about proving a math thing, but about other stuff. So it's about finding ways of taking what it is that you do, even if they're not, um, even if, if you feel like uh, they're not as pretty or they're harder to connect to, finding a way in. And there, there, there are ways in. So, um, so now it's, uh, I, want you, I, want to take, uh, I want you guys to just spend a little bit of time doing it, and then we'll talk about it. So I'd like for you to, to get into pairs, uh, or trios, but ideally pairs, with somebody. And I want you to just think about those story types that I mentioned earlier, the ingredients that go into a story, how you might, um, how you might use story to talk about your science. And also think about who you're going to be telling this story to. So who's your audience? Is it going to be um, 
you know, s someone at the uh, at a holiday party? Is it going to be somebody who you're pitching your uh, your science to in a grant way, or is wh whoever it is? Figure out who you want to talk to, and then figure out how you're going to take your science and use story in order to tell them about it. Does that make sense? Any questions? And uh, and I'll I'll circulate. So if you've got a, a question, raise your hand. And for those of you viewing this remotely, do the same thing. Turn to the person next to you, form pairs, and and think about that. So we'll take about uh, we'll take a few minutes to do that.
Okay, why don't we come back? So I'm wondering how did it go? You know, like what uh, what was what what was tricky about that? What what did you find challenging? Oh jeez. Oh God! I know. Get back in my cage. Okay. Thanks. Well, what was what was challenging about that? Yeah. So right, complex. How do you take complex things, communicate them, and still be authentic to what it is you're starting with? Yeah, great. Let me let me just say that, um, you know, I think one pitfall is that we often feel like we have to convey, like, there's so much microstructure to the to our understanding of something, and we have to convey all that texture. Whereas that can sometimes cause people to not absorb very much of it at all. And so sometimes you think you're saying less. Like actually in a story, you, you may be, you think, I'm not getting as much information across. But the fact that you're delivering it inside a vessel that is more palatable means that people will take, will hold on to what they do, what you, the, the information that is there longer in a way that stays with them. So I think ultimately, you know, it's like running a, a filter over that microstructure. And you get, you know, you still want to get a sense of the contours, but you don't have to know all of the little, you know, microvilli on the thing. You just need to know, oh, it's, it, it looks a bit like this. That's the sense you want to give people. So, so it is, so you, ha you kind of have to figure out how much you tune that filter depending on who you're talking to. Yeah. Yeah, did you have something? I think one of the biggest difficulties is that an individual, a lot of us, is just putting bricks in the wall. Yeah. And a thousand years from now, that wall is going to be big and strong and robust. But, it, you know, we focus on what we do and not the fabric of what we're trying to accomplish on a really long term scale. So when somebody says, well, what do you do? It's hard to compress. Right. So in that case, um, uh, just I don't know if I don't know. If, I'll just repeat the question just in case, or the comment just in case. But it's like you know, you've got like you're each you've got you're each working on a brick, and, how, and over time you're building up this big edifice. But how do you get when they when someone says, "What do you do?" How do you convey? I mean, so what I would say is like if someone says, "What do you, you know?" You might think about saying, "Well, let me take let me give you the." the big sense of this. Imagine in a hundred years and you just like paint that that backdrop for them. So, but it is about, you know, obviously you know how that brick is fitting into the larger thing. But ideally if you paint the backdrop well, then they'll know why that brick matters. Um, but even that brick is like, it's an important, like you, you're working on that brick, you're holding it every day. And that's that's also a, um, worth sharing. But yes, thinking about the larger context is important. Did it help working in pairs or talking it, talking to people about it? I th I think that can be a useful thing, like talking to other folks, especially if they're not in your lab, or in your department, or in science, and just kind of giving these stories a whirl and and t testing it out on them. I think can be helpful. Other thoughts? Yeah. Can, can st stories be fictitious? Yeah. Can stories be fictitious? Yes. I mean, I think it, it depends on on the audience and what you're trying to do. But certainly, if you are wanting to talk about phytoplankton or about the dynamics of ocean acidification, you might cast certain characters in a plausible narrative 
but that actually Phil the phytoplankton doesn't really talk, you know, or whatever. But, you know, so you might think about who, who is it that's, but if a kid's going to get it in that way, then yeah, I think it's okay to come up with, um, you know, narrative, nonfiction type things. Absolutely. Yeah, that's right. Definitely. Um, just a few more things, uh, and that is, when you are telling a story, it is, it is like, it is so informal, you know? It really is just like you would tell a story to somebody about what happened over the weekend, like what happened over Thanksgiving uh, at the bar. It's, it's that easy. And in some ways, that's what feel. it's like how do, so it's easy in the way it's like, oh yeah, I know that context. So think about how do you bring science into that informal place. The other thing I just want to mention briefly is that you, you know, one, I, I, just a quick, like two minutes on dealing with the media. So if you're ever called up to give a, to do a story, you know, they want to interview you, they want to profile you, whatever, you should know that you have rights as a scientist, as a person th that, that you need to, that you're allowed to maintain. So if they call you up and say, um, oh, you study uh, mollusks in the Bay, uh, can you tell me about, um, I, I, I'm on deadline and I've got a question about the incoming hurricane. And it's like totally not connected. You're allowed to say, I don't, I don't, I'm not going to answer those questions. Or if it is related to what you work on and they're on deadline, say, and you want to collect your thoughts and do a little bit of background research, you can say, can I call you in five minutes? Or call you back in ten, whatever. They can, ha they can wait five or ten minutes. And if they can't and you don't feel comfortable, again, it's okay to say no, but it's okay to prep. If you are going into an interview, you should know who the journalist is that, that is covering you. Listen to their work or read their work, watch their work so that you know what you're getting into and, um, and get a sense for how they report science and make sure that it feels, um, that it feels comfortable for you. Um, let's see. You are allowed to ask, what is this story about? How are you going to use me in this piece? Uh, so that you have some context for it. Uh, and the last couple of points relating to this, I, I'm going to um, take us to Thorndike, Maine, where uh, we stayed at an Airbnb and met this young fellow, Jonah, who was like super inquisitive. And I told him I did radio, and uh, he's like, oh, can I record stuff for you? Anyway, so here are a couple of uh, quick exchanges that we had that I feel are illuminating. Uh, in terms of how you might think about dealing with the media. What, what's, what's your name? J Jonah? Oh, oh! I thought you were forgetting, so I said it like that. I guess I'll... Jonah. Cool, and you're six years old. Six years old. So I, should I say my birthday? Sure. April 25th. That's my birthday. So you're almost six and a half. Yeah. Why are you recording every single thing we say? That's just what I do. I just record lots of, lots of tape. And then he puts it together and it makes sense. That's my wife. Hopefully it makes sense at the end. So, uh, re reporters, we spend way more time with you than we probably should. Ideally. You know, I mean, like, I, like one, of my, one of my friends is like, oh, I, I won't take more time from you than I possibly can. I will, uh, most interviews last at least an hour for me, and I'm working on usually five minute pieces, and the interviewee's going to be in that piece, their voice might be in it for a minute or something. But ultimately it's about like, there's just like, you know, you collect lots of data, it takes you five years to produce something this big. You know, it's like that. We spend a lot of time with you in the field asking you lots of questions that may or may not seem related to what you thought the interview was about, but we assemble it into uh, a, a, a story from there. Am I going to be able to hear it put together? It depends what I do with it. I may just use a short clip. Well, maybe can, I wanted to hear it while you guys on the recorder. Oh, you, you, we can't hear the finished piece on the recorder. Why? Because I have to use my computer in order to edit the audio. Ah. So, you know, there's a lot that happens after the interview. There's a bit of post-production that takes place where we work on a script and we edit it. The thing is, and, and, and you know, and often people will say, oh, can I, can I, read the script before it goes on the air. I were advised not to do that because what I do is I, I, I fact check 
I try to fact check everything so that the information is right. But usually journalists don't give um, people, the sources, access to their story ahead of time. And that's just because we have a sense of what the narrative should be, we make sure all the facts are right, but we're sort of in charge of, of framing the story. Um, and finally, I would say, you know, I would encourage you if, you know, to just practice doing this. You can practice informally talking to people, and there are plenty of places online where you can develop your own blog and your own voice and uh, you, or your own podcast. If you're thinking about this, if it's appealing to you of telling these types of stories, w there is always need for more stories about science in the world. And I am happy to help if you are interested feel free to reach out, um, and, I, and I'll, I'll put my contact information up later. And so I hope uh, that you know the next time somebody asks you what is it you do or why do you care so much about this, why don't you ever come home anymore, why are you always in the lab, that you're able to explain that and to communicate that, that fire that's burning inside of you. And so, of course, there's a lot more to say about this. This is really just the beginning or perhaps the tail end of a much larger uh, idea. But, um, but with that, uh, I'm happy to take, uh, what time is it? It is 12.01. So um, I'm, if you want to ask additional questions, feel free to come up afterwards. But um, I'm around for the rest of the day. So thanks so much. Everybody here, and um, so I'll okay. I won't answer them for you. <laughs> okay. Are there questions? Yeah. The story where um, it was regarding how the Simpsons episodes snuck in all the math equations, and it was actually real math theorems. You'll have to find it. It's yeah. Really what, what, what stood out to you about that? Um, well. Growing up, you know, kids love cartoons, and you're being subjected to high levels of math in the background. But that really made me think about how you're communicating science to non-science people, and that's a nice way that you're sneaking in um, a very complex mathematical thing. That's great. No, I haven't seen that. I, so if we Google NPR Simpsons math, we'll find it. Yeah. No, I think that's great. I mean, those sorts of examples, there, so many people are thinking, there's, and there's no one way to do it. You know, there are lots of ways of packaging up this sort of content in, in creative ways and ways that people are already in consuming media. So that's great to hear about. Thanks. I'll look for it. Listen for it. Uh, it's a are there locations online where you guys are, are storing kind of the, the narrative, uh, science narrative and science stories like your website, but you know, in the oceanographic community, do you know if they're going on a COSI page or if they're being stored at this hole? Or is there, is there a, a place that people are archiving this, kind of like the, uh, that, that NPR series with the people telling the story core? Yeah, so the question is, are, are, is there a place where particularly ocean stories? Yeah, ocean science. Yeah, is there a place where we're kind of archiving ocean science stories? Uh, not that I know of. I know that the uh, I did this podcast about ocean called Ocean Gazing for a while, and there we have a you know online we've got lots of stories about ocean obs observatories and ocean observing science. Um, but y there's a friends of mine did a thing where they found, they were trying to come up with some of the best science stories that were out there in different media, and they put it out to a public vote, and then they put it up online, and I don't know what the status of that is. But, uh, so I'm, I'm not as familiar, it tends to be a bit more fragmented, there's not kind of one place. But, the web is a vast place, and I, you know, if that's something you feel like would be useful, I, I think, you know, there are lots of, um, web platforms where you might be able to just like pull the stories. You should probably, well, they're, they're public domain. You can just pull them and put them there, you know. 
But I think that sort of archiving would be great to have. There is something called Listen Edition, which is um, was started by a former uh, public radio reporter in Boston, where she has taken public radio stories and paired them with curriculum for teachers to use in their classrooms across a variety of subjects. So I bet if you went there, you would find some some science stories. I, I know you would, in addition to other topic areas. Yeah, Allison? Um, nobody needs to hear my voice loud, but anyway. Um, <laughs> um, in thinking about podcasts, so do you have tips on how to do that well? So when it's just audio, how do you really convey a story without it just being a flat kind of interview style? And how long is too long for like until it becomes like this drone of you know information? So tips on podcasts. Yeah. Um, are you thinking about like how you might make your own podcast? Yeah. So first, before I answer the questions about content, just in terms of technical uh, requirements, like to do it, you just need a recorder, an audio recorder, which. Are, is very common in smartphones now, so you could record audio pretty easily. Editing software, um, Hindenburg and Reaper are two programs that are quite good and are under $100. Um, all of that is, um, you can learn about the types of microphones to get, digital recorders, audio editing, at this site called transom.org, T-R-A-N-S-O-M.org. Um, and so they've got a bunch of tools and tips for, for the, the the technical parts of it. Um, and then you just need to have a website where you would be posting the content so people could stream it. In terms of what you might put in it, um, ultimately I think I think the important thing is that you feel interested in it. You know? Like if you are engaged and curious in what you're talking about and you are and it's coming from a genuine place, then I think listeners will want to hear that too. If you feel like you're listening to it and it's 45 minutes and you tuned out after the third minute, then cut it at three minutes, you know? So, but if you think like it's a great conversation, you'll get that sense too. It's good to put that out to people and say, what do you think, you know, to get some feedback on it. Um, there's an organization called Association for Independence in Radio, AIR for short, and they have a program, oh no, they do, but I'm actually thinking of a different, it's like all the public radio groups I'm thinking of. Public Radio Exchange, PRX, which is a distribution platform for audio. So when you make your podcast and you put it up on your site, you should also upload it to PRX. You can think of it a bit like YouTube for audio, except that it's where um, stations, like local public radio stations, would look for content and then distribute it to their audience. They'd take it from there and they'd put it on broadcast. PRX has a program called Second Ear, and it's a way for people who want to get feedback on their audio pieces to essentially send it to what's like an audio doctor, where that person will provide you with input and feedback on it. So that might be a good platform for that. So I don't think there's no fixed rule. I mean, how many of you are listening to Serial? Okay. Oh, you should. Serial's great. It's a spin-off of This American Life. It's one story told weekly over 12 weeks. The first episode was about 55 minutes. Each additional episode has been 35 to 40. They are masters at telling really incredible stories. That story needs to be 12 episodes long. or that you know They're conceiving it, of it at that scale. Other stories, most of the stories on radio are three to five minutes and often don't need to be much longer than that. So ultimately it's about you know what stories you want to tell and how long they feel like they need to be. And also the style a little bit, if it's an interview style, some programs go for an hour on the radio. It, it really just depends. But I would send it out, ask people what they think, see how long you're interested in it, and just experiment and try it out. Yeah. Okay, well, oh, was that? Nope. Okay, uh, I'm happy to answer additional questions afterwards. The other thing I should say is, um, I mentioned this before uh, to some of you, I have a, an email list where I uh, let people know about upcoming stuff I'm doing. It's very low traffic. It's like three emails, four emails a year uh, because I, I don't want to flood it. So it's like just the stuff I'm most excited about. If you want to be on that list, um, you, it's called RE Air. Uh, you can uh, sign up in my little book, which I will put over here with a pen. No pressure. 
And uh, also, I'm happy to continue these conversations afterwards by email or by phone, really. So uh, feel free. I've got cards, and I can give you my email address. Thank you again. Thank you.